All right. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the snow day yesterday. Um, it wasn't really a snow day for most people, but I didn't want to drive in the snow. All right. So today, we're covering chapter six. Uh, in this class, we'll be not really following the book's order too often. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. The main one is, personally, I think it makes a lot of sense to talk about data, then talk about basic modeling, and then go pretty in depth about the ERDs. Okay? So that's the approach we'll be taking. And then after that, we'll start using SQL. So, just want to make sure everyone's clear with that. We're not going in order. Okay? Make sure that you follow along in this uh, scheduling canvas. So it's got the different uh, days sort of listed there. So the specific topics we'll be talking about today are going to be overview of the design process. Okay, so we're going to go through that in a good bit of detail. Talk about the entity relationship model. Talk about complex attributes. A little bit about some different uh, cardinalities. We'll certainly talk about removing redundancy, and we're going to cover that more in Chapter 7 when we get to normalization as well as well as ER features. All right? So, this should be a review from systems analysis. All right, when you're doing any sort of development, you always start off with the requirements. So who can tell me what requirements are? Yeah, so what the system needs to do, right? And that's going to be specific to, what is that specific to? The needs of who? Client, organization, something like that. Okay? So you start off gathering requirements. All right, then you design it. Okay, we're on this part right here. Okay, so we've talked about gathering requirements. Meet with the client, discuss their needs, discuss what they want the system to be able to do. All right? And you can do lots of different approaches for this. You can do like a basic little mock up. Okay, so a mock-up may be helpful for a couple different reasons. All right, the main one being that they can sort of visually see what the end system's expected to look like. Does that mean that it's legally binding? Of course not. But that's just one approach. Okay, what are some other approaches we may use for that? Yeah, how do we gather requirements? What are some approaches we can use? We talked about little mock-up images. What else? Interviews. Okay, could we do like a focus group type deal? All right, so imagine, I'm not going to do this, but imagine if, I, uh, if I'm i Mr., uh, I guess I'd be doctor, wouldn't I? Okay, imagine if I'm doctor database designer. How about that alliteration? Okay. And I'm sitting here at the head of the table, and uh, we had everyone here, and we just talked. Okay, could I do that? There's lots of different approaches to take. There's no right answer. Uh, but there could be some wrong answers. All right, so what would a wrong answer look like for gathering requirements? What would that result in? Exactly right. Okay. So if you don't gather the requirements, you know, you're not going to have a very functional system by the needs of the organization. It doesn't mean the system's not functional. It just means it doesn't do what the organization wants it to do. Okay. So then we design. Okay. This is where we do both the logical and the physical design. Now, are we going to be dealing with a lot of physical design in 2022? Why not? So even if we're doing it locally, though, are we going to be doing a lot of physical design, most likely? Exactly right. Okay, so like, uh, like you guys are saying, you know, it's handled automatically. Okay, whatever database platform you're using, be it MySQL, be it some Oracle product, be it Microsoft SQL Server, 
be a Postgres SQL? Doesn't matter, okay? Chances you're gonna be doing physical database design are relatively low, okay? So keep that in mind. Now what are you likely to do? Okay, logical design. Who remembers what logical design is? Exactly. Okay, so basically, when you think about logical design, one acronym that pretty much covers everything you're going to need. Okay, the ERD, Entity Relationship Diagram. Okay, and then once we move back to the earlier chapters, funnily enough, okay, we're going to move to implementation. All right, so that's when you're going to begin to develop it and also put it into practice. All right, so basically, that's what we're doing, okay? Phased approach. There's a couple different phased approaches we could use. Um, certainly, we could use a uh, an approach where we just all of a sudden flip a switch, right? We can do that. Uh, we could do it in a tiered fashion. So, you know, let's just use two different colors here. Okay, red and black. Okay, so we'll say that black is the old system and red is the new system. Okay, so the old system is going to start off at 100% utilization, and then in a tiered approach, we're just going to sort of stair step it down. Okay, so we're moving users, you know, accordingly. Okay, then likewise, the new system in red here is going to sort of fill that gap. Okay, not a perfect drawing, but I think you get the idea. Okay. That's certainly one approach we could take. Uh, could we just do a regular old beta testing period with, say, 10% of the users? Sure. What else could we do? Um, so, yeah, that's certainly a different developmental uh, technique where maybe we build it out and deploy it as we build it. That's certainly an approach we could take. Regarding the phases, though, in terms of using a different phase, okay, so we talked about, you know, just flipping a switch. Can we do them both simultaneously? Sure. Okay, so if we're so inclined, we got both systems used 100%. All right, let's assume those are touching. I don't want to mess up these nice new markers, okay? So everyone understand these. Lots of different approaches. Now. What makes one approach better than another? If both systems are capable of fully interfacing with each other, why not keep them both on? Okay, think about a website like Reddit. Okay, I'm sure we have a few Redditors in here. Okay, they have both the modern platform and they have old.reddit.com, right? Okay, so what's happening there is they are using both systems simultaneously, are they not? Okay. So that's what we're talking about with phases. All right, then you test it, and I would probably say you test it at all these phases, but it's going by a traditional view of SDLC. They sort of suggest that you test it after you've implemented it, which, you know, whatever. And then finally you revise it. Okay. So in the revision, we may realize that we can make improvements. Uh, we just make those improvements. And some people believe this cycle sort of repeats itself over and over. I don't necessarily hold that viewpoint. Because uh, I think that for most systems, you know, you're not going back to the drawing board over and over, are you? Okay, let's face it. Most systems you're going to be developing, you're going to develop it once. There may be some slight test and revision. But, I mean, come on, you're not going to be doing the same thing over and over. That's just silly, is it not? Okay. So keep that sort of stuff in mind. Just going to review the terms of databases briefly. So we know that table, uh, data, uh, databases are laid out in tables. Okay, the table is going to be comprised of columns and rows. So the rows, of course, are going to be the records of a table. Columns, of course, are going to be the variables that we're having about the table. All right. Then you got relations. Relations, of course, relate two tables together 
using a foreign key. You got primary key, of course, is going to be what uniquely identifies each row in the table. So there's a question for you. Um, let's say that we are assuming that people have a home phone number. Okay, let's say we're a dentist's office. Could we have the home phone number be a primary key? Why or why not? Why not? Exactly. Okay, I think it's pretty feasible to see that there may be a married couple with a couple children, right? Okay, so you got the husband and the wife and all the children. They may all have the same home phone number. Okay, I don't know too many homes with multiple home phone numbers. All right? I don't know too many homes that have a home phone for that matter. But that's just one example of what a primary key is. It must uniquely identify each and every uh, row inside the table. Okay? And a composite key is simply going to be uh, a compilation of attributes, so two or more attributes that collectively form the primary key. And this is a review, so I'm going a little bit fast, but feel free to stop me if you need to. Okay, so with ERDs, we change up the terminology just a little bit. Okay, we call a table an entity. We call a column an attribute. Okay, we call a row an instance. And everything else the same, right? All right, so some basic rules for ERD. Who likes rules in here? Anyone just a rule? We got one rule fanatic in here. That's good. All right. You're going to like this slide. Okay. Entities are always represented via boxes. Okay. So the boxes are going to be uh, where we're going to have the entity name. Okay. And that entity name is going to be a singular noun. All right. It's not going to be plural. Why not? Why do we not have plural entity names? So, you know, there's a lot of reasons. The main reason is is because the rules say they're singular nouns, okay? But that's a bit of a smart aleck answer. Okay, a better answer would be that by having it be singular, we're allowing for an entity to have a single row. I guess I should say an entity to have a single instance. But there's a lot of other reasons as well. Okay. Uh, another rule. Your attribute name's got to be meaningful. Okay, so let's say, for instance, we had... I don't think I can hold two things at once. But let's say that we had um, uh, an entity. All right. Someone throw me their favorite noun. Pizza. All right? So this is what an entity looks like. So what goes directly below the entity name? Primary key. That's good. Okay? So imagine if my attribute names were pizza1. And then I had pizza2. And pizza3. Does that mean anything? Why not? Well, you can't. Okay, you don't know what pizza one is. Now, let's say that this is for a menu. So we're not putting a serial number on a pizza. That'd be pretty silly, wouldn't it? Okay, and why would that be silly? Okay, so number one, you know, do you need to track a pizza to that extent? Not likely. Um, I think a funnier reason to not put a serial number on a pizza is, does a pizza last very long? Okay. Certainly not in my household. Okay. So we're going to call this guy pizza name. Because we're assuming that each pizza has a unique name, right? So with that assumption, we can have other meaningful attributes for pizza. Okay, how about size? How about uh, topping one? Topping two? And topping three? And this, generally speaking, is not a good way to do things. 
all right? But for this example, it's fine, okay? What other information do we need to know about a pizza? I'm going to put price in here for now, all right? A couple other things you guys can think of. Crust, okay. Couldn't hear it. Cook time. Important to know. You definitely don't want to undercook or overcook a pizza. I think that's probably enough for this example. All right. So, problem with doing topping one, topping two, and topping three. Uh, does every pizza have three toppings? Why not? That's right. So this approach only allows pizza to have up to three, and we're going to have a lot of nulls, particularly for the third, okay, because most pizzas are going to have cheese and pepperoni or cheese and something else, all right? But what about this third guy down here? What's your favorite type of pizza? Pepperoni? What else do you guys like? Cheese? So cheese would actually have topping two and topping three be null, right? All right, name some other pizza types you like. Sausage, okay, so sausage is going to have one and two. I don't even know how many that has. Whatever they got in the kitchen, I guess. All right, so you get the idea. It's not a good way to do things. We're going to come back to this. All right, attribute names have no spaces. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. The main one is, Spaces are difficult to work with once we get to SQL, okay? Uh, it's not impossible. It's just, well, why not just use something like camel case? Okay, you guys know camel case, right? So that's whenever we uh, use an uppercase letter for the first uh, letter of the word, okay? So see, I'll have pizza name. See how the N is capitalized there? That's camel case. Attributes are atomic and single valued. Okay, so imagine if instead of having topping one, topping two, topping three, imagine if I instead had toppings and you listed off every single topping. Would that be pretty disastrous to work with? Okay, it would. It'd be very difficult to do a query based on that, would it not? Because imagine, you know, a lot of these queries that we're going to be running, okay, they actually require everything to be in the same order. Now you could argue, what about regular expression and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, whatever. Okay, but for the most part, you're going to have to have the exact text. So it's a lot easier to remember pepperoni than pepperoni, comma, cheese, comma, uh, onion, comma, sausage, comma, I guess I put bacon. Is that what that stuff is on the Supreme? Little, uh, well, you get the idea. Okay, it'd be very difficult to find that, would it not? That's why we use atomic and single valued attributes. Okay, primary key and foreign key are labeled clearly. That's a very bad thing when you're looking at an ERD and you can't make heads or tails of what the primary key and the foreign keys are. All right, the textbook, for instance. Is it very easy to look at some of those diagrams in Chapter 2 and figure out what the primary and foreign keys are? I would say it's not that easy. It's not impossible, but you've got to look at it for a while, okay? Is it not a lot easier to use something like PK and FK? Because you immediately know PK is primary key, right? At least you should, okay? If you don't immediately know that, you should probably study that a little bit. All right, PK are unique in entity. And what that means is that we don't have two pizzas with the same name, okay? Because it's a primary key, every single instance of this entity has to be unique, okay? So pizza name can't repeat if that's your primary key. Think about a database. You got a table, okay? Everything in the primary key must be unique, okay? So there can't be two rows of the same primary key. Does that make sense? Why? So it wouldn't uniquely identify, but what does that mean? in a practical standpoint. I'll tell you the main reason. 
All right, so I've mentioned, you know, you have a relationship on one side, specifically the side that has a one and only one, okay, you're using a foreign key, right? Okay, that's how you identify the relationship. But when you're tying that back to the primary key in another table, okay, if those values are not unique, how are you going to know which row it corresponds with? You're not. And that's going to be a big problem for you when you begin to do joins and when you begin to do other stuff. Because if for some reason you manage to use a non-unique primary key as a foreign key, or more likely you manage to use a field that's not acting as a primary key um, but could be a candidate key and you use that as a foreign key in a different table, okay, you're going to have a very hard time. And in fact, your program's likely going to throw error messages. All right, does everyone understand that? So primary key must be unique, as well as a foreign key. So like, let's say over here, um, let's, let's just assume that price was unique, okay? It's not, but let's assume it were. So every pizza has a different price. What does that mean about price? It's a what type of key? Primary key? foreign key or candidate key? Yeah, assuming that price was unique in pizza. So it's not necessarily the primary key because we specified the primary key up here. What is it instead? Candidate key, because it could be, but it's not. It's not acting as a primary key. All right, so if every price is unique, and then let's say we have a relationship with, um, I don't know, uh, order. Okay, so we got an order entity over here. And, you know, we put that relationship. Could we potentially use price as the foreign key inside of order? Yeah, we can. Okay, but as soon as we have a repeating price, that's going to cause a lot of problems, right? So that's what we're talking about there. That's why, okay? I think for databases, it's very important to understand not just the what, but also the why. Okay, because I can throw a hundred rules up here. But if you don't understand them, you know, it doesn't really matter, does it? So I want everyone to understand what we're talking about and how these relationships actually connect. Okay? Relationships are meaningful and labeled. Now, when I say labeled, I don't mean, you know, some word. Personally, I don't care whether or not you use a word to describe a relationship. I'm talking about, you know, pizza belongs to one to many orders, and order has one to many pizzas. That's what type of relationship? So it's a many to many, okay, because we've got a many on each side. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is we can't stick a foreign key on either one of these, all right? Because there may be an order that has multiple pizzas. And there may be multiple pizzas in an order. Okay, so if we have pizza name, let's just say pepperoni. Is that only going to be used in a single order? Has only one person in history ever had a pepperoni pizza? Okay, that's pretty silly. So we can assume that pizza belongs to one to many orders. Okay, but order may have more than one pizza inside of it. All right, so how do we address that? Do we just leave it like this? No, we address it with what? So an associative entity, which is basically a new table. Okay, so we come up here, and we will come up with some new entity name. All right, so we could call this pizza order. All right, and then the primary keys for it, we're just going to take the primary keys from the two entities. So pizza name and also we'll call this order number. So we'll say PK order now. Order now. Now, are we done? What did I forget to do? So I labeled those two as primary keys. What did I not label them as? Foreign key. Why are they foreign keys? 
That's exactly right, okay? Pizza name reference is this dude right here. Order number reference is this guy over here, okay? So the combination of those form a what type of key? Composite key, that's exactly right. Two or more attributes acting as primary keys are composite key. All right, so now we got this guy, we can go ahead and get rid of this relationship right here. So sad to just get rid of a relationship right before Valentine's Day, isn't it? I always make bad jokes about that around uh, database time. All right, so now we also know that we have pizza order. Okay, should we probably throw a quantity in here? I think you probably should. Okay, because otherwise, you know, you don't know how many pizzas of each type of pizza are in the order. All right. So now, of course, we know that pizza name and order number. So this is going to be, we're looking at pizza, may have one to many, but over here it's going to be a one and only one. Okay, because pizza order is one and only one pizza. We can tell that because pizza name is part of the primary key, which means that it's going to be an atomic single valued. Uh, attribute, right? So in other words, I may have multiple pizza order instances for a single order, right? Because there may be multiple pizzas. But within each of these pizza orders, there's going to be how many pizza name? One and only one. Okay. Why is it not zero to one? It's part of the primary key, which means it's not null. All right? Is everyone understanding this? Same thing with the other side, okay? So order may have more than one pizza order. But a pizza order, because it has order number, it's part of the primary key, it's one and only one. Okay? It can't be zero because primary keys cannot be null. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about labeling the cardinality for relationships. I mean, I've seen people who like to do, you know, pizza has pizza order. To me, that's implied, okay? You can do that if you want. I don't mind. That's just not what I mean when I'm saying labeling the relationships. All right, any questions? Okay, cardinality. This is going to be talking about the minimum instances of a relationship and the maximum instances of a relationship. And there's a couple key symbols to know. Okay? So we have my hero zero. It's expressed with an O. Okay? I have number one. Okay? You have in, which is going to be replaced with some integer you're using. And then lastly, you got the crow's foot down here, which is represented as many. All right. So specifically, I have some specific cardinalities we want to be mindful of. Um, so what I'm going to do, can everyone see over here? You guys can see over here? All right, I'm just going to draw an entity over here, and I'm just going to draw a bunch of lines going to it. It's not an art class, so, uh, you yeah, know, it's not going to look too good. Um, so let's start off at the top here. We got 0 to 1. Okay, so we're going to start off with the 0 symbol and then the 1. Okay, kind of looks like the symbol for a toilet. All right, so don't forget that one. Okay, then you have 1 to 1. It's just going to be two one symbols. All right. Uh, zero to many. Okay. So the minimum is what? Zero. And the maximum is going to be crow's foot, which represents many. Now, sometimes I'll slip up and I'll call it infinite or infinity. One of those. There's no real maximum amount here. So I will allow any term within reason. 
All right, then we have our good friend one to many. What's the minimum symbol going to be? What's the max? I think you guys are getting this. All right, zero to n. So we start off with what symbol? Okay, we end with what symbol? So it's going to be a one symbol with the n represented up there, sort of as a superscript, okay? Then we got our good friend n to many. Okay, so we start off with the one symbol with the n as a superscript, and then we have the many symbol. All right, and those two are going to be pretty rare. Um, there are certainly some cases in which you will have them uh, there, but there's very few. Does that make sense? Mostly you're going to be focused on these top uh, four. And there's one more, okay? So I'm just going to draw two entity lines right there and then a relationship between them. So many to many, it doesn't really matter. It only matters about the maximum cardinality. Okay, so in a many to many, you could have a zero on one side and a one doesn't matter, it's still many to many. And of course you address that using an associative entity. So just to recap, how do we get the primary key for the associative entity? That's exactly right, okay? Now, that's the most common way. Technically speaking, could you get away with uh, assigning a generated uh, key to this and then using pizza name and order number just as foreign keys. Could you get away with that? Yeah, you can. And in some cases that makes the most sense. But not in every case, right? So, you know, it's always acceptable to use a composite key. Some people don't like composite keys. I don't mind composite keys because they work, don't they? You can always uniquely identify an instance of pizza order with those two attributes. Why not use that? You know, There's not a single right answer in a database. There's not a single right answer in an entity relationship diagram. But what there are, are there are a lot of incorrect answers. Okay, And there's also going to be a lot of answers that don't meet the needs of the company. So you want to avoid that sort of thing. All right. Questions? All right, let's talk about weak and strong entities, okay? So it has nothing to do with its bench press, okay? A weak entity is an entity that derives its meaning from another entity. That is to say, it uses foreign keys, okay? So up here, which entity may we think of as a weak entity? Because it's deriving its identity from other entities. Now, technically speaking, there's some slight differences between associative entities and weak entities. Okay, to me, weak entities are not really that important of a concept. All right, it's somewhat important that you at least understand the terminology. But just in general, you know, a better example would be section and course. Okay, so we got a course entity. All right. And it's got a bunch of attributes in it. So course name, course num. Okay, you're probably going to have like credit information, right? How many credit hours? Um, subject. What else do we need? That's probably enough for now. Okay. Then you got our good friend, the section entity. So whatever the primary key is over here, probably course name, because that's going to be unique to each course, right? Whereas subject isn't unique, course number is not unique, credits obviously aren't unique. So the idea here is we're going to have a foreign key for course num. Okay, because of that foreign key, it's what type of entity? Weak. Okay, course is what type of entity? 
All right, it doesn't skip leg day. Okay, it's taking that protein powder. Okay, it's a strong entity. Everything in here originates in corpse. Does that make sense? All right. It doesn't actually relate to fitness, by the way. All right, redundancy. Now, a major goal of databases are to reduce redundant storage of information. Why do we want to reduce redundancy? List me off some reasons. Save on storage costs. Okay? So when we think about a database, I think I might have said this last semester in the networking class. Okay, do we just have a single copy of our database? Why not? Okay, so it's important to have backups when we're talking about databases. Okay, so going beyond that, okay, so we talked about backups, you know, that's going to be very costly. Okay, because when you're talking about enterprise storage, all right, it's not like you can just go on Amazon and get a $80 terabyte SSD, is it? Probably going to be closer to two to 300 for enterprise grade storage, right? You get multiple drives. You know, it's generally speaking best practice to have at least two copies of any database. At least two. Sometimes more. Okay, because let's say that you roll out a change. Maybe you do a drop. And maybe you meant to just drop certain records, but you forgot to apply a where clause. Or you forgot to apply a having clause. Okay? You just dropped an entire table. If you don't have a database, what do you do? I'm going to say, if you don't have a backup, what do you do? So, you know, that's very possible as the end result. Um, you know, hopefully, especially on like a lot of spinning drives, hopefully you'd be able to use recovery tools and recover that. Um, but for the most part, it's gone. What does that mean? Yeah, it means your organization no longer has that information. That could be a very substantial problem, right? So you have a backup that's you know going to be updated in real time, and then you also have a more long-term backup. Okay, and then sometimes you have a completely uh, cold backup. But what I mean by cold backup, of course, is that it's not actively being updated. So depending on how frequently you're updating your database, that's going to differ. Okay. A lot of different rules for backups. Uh, so, for instance, um, let's say that I had a database for my research. Would I want to exclusively have all the backups in my house? Why not? Okay, a fire. All right. Pretty unlikely that someone would break in, but it's certainly not impossible for someone to break in and steal them, right? Um, why else would I not have them in a the single location? Any sort of natural disaster, any sort of human event? Um, there's probably some others we could think of. So you have them not even just in different buildings, but you know, try to have them in different physical locations. So maybe I got one in Colorado. Maybe I leave one at my parents' house in Georgia. Okay, that's separating out. Okay, is it likely that it uh? Natural disaster would affect both Colorado and Georgia. It's not impossible, but it's not very likely either, is it? All right, so that's something to keep in mind with backups. All right, what's a better way to do backups? Patrick, you were talking about cloud earlier. Do you think that's a better way? I think it's probably a better way too, okay? Because, you know, if you think about it, if I'm using one drive, okay, let's say that my primary solid state kicks the bucket, okay? So I'm sad, but I didn't lose my data, did I? Okay, let's say that my solid state kicks the bucket, and let's say that something bad happens to my house, okay? That would really be unfortunate. But, you know, I would still have my data, right? Okay. I'd be pretty bummed, not going to lie, but wouldn't lose the data. So keep in mind that. All right, storing information as few times as possible. I don't mean store information only once as in you have no backups. I mean store the information once as in 
you're not having the same piece of information in multiple parts of your database. Now, is redundancy 100% unavoidable? Who says yes? Okay, who says no? Why do you say no? So, I think probably the biggest place in which redundancy is going to be a factor are foreign keys. Okay? You can't really feasibly get rid of these foreign keys up here, can you? Okay? You know, the best thing you could do, and this, this is not the best thing, is then you should do it. This is the best way I can think of to eliminate redundant foreign keys would be to have an assignment table in which you assign the foreign key some, I don't know, some other value. Okay? And that's a really stupid thing to do. Okay? Why is that a stupid thing to do? Takes up space and very confusing. Okay? So if I called pizza name, let's say I rephrase that to pizza number. Okay? And now instead of having the pizza name, I've got 1 through 150. Okay? You gotta look up what each of those numbers are. That's a lot of time. Okay? So foreign keys are, are okay. Everything else, redundancy wise, we wanna eliminate as much as possible. Alright? Uh, an important way to do this calculated fields. So in general, let's say we are a bank. Okay? Do we want to store the balance? As a field? Why not? It's constantly changing, okay? That's going to be a lot of updates. That's going to be a lot of cycles. Uh, what else? Do we need to store the balance? No, right? Okay? So the reason for that is we can use a calculated field. All right. So the calculated field, what we're doing essentially is we're taking information, and as needed, we are, of course, uh, going through and calculating the field. It's not always calculated. Now, for a bank, let's say it's checking account. Could that change things a little bit? All right. It could, depending on policies and stuff, because what do we not want to have? It starts with an O. Overdraft, right? All right. So, of course, an overdraft would be where you have a negative balance. For a bank, we obviously don't want that. All right. Now, kind of going off on an aside, some banks actually do want that. Why? Overdraft fees, okay? I'm not going to name any banks in particular. Nothing in this class is financial advice. But imagine we were a bank, okay? with a name like Boa Constrictor. You guys know what I'm talking about here? Okay. And imagine if we could uh, first, you know, let's say there were X amount of transactions in a day. Let's just say 10. Okay. Could we, as a Boa Constricting bank, go through and begin with the largest transactions for that day, for that particular account? Okay. You guys see what I'm getting at here? And so if we structure the uh, transactions in that way, are we more or less likely to have more overdraft for that particular customer for that particular day? More, because let's say the first five transactions were for 500 bucks, and let's say there was 2,500 bucks in the account. And let's say the last five were for 25 bucks a piece. Okay, so in that example, Okay, is it feasible that we could charge a single overdraft fee? Yeah, so if we structured it to where we had one of the 500 be uh, one of the last transactions, that would be a single overdraft fee. Is it also feasible we could have five overdraft fees? All right. So that's why sometimes it may make sense to allow for uh, that sort of thing, but not always. Okay, let's say we're a credit union. Do you think we're going to want to be charging five overdraft fees for something like that? 
Probably not, right? Okay. So keep that kind of thing in mind. All right. Not financial advice, though. So you're going to be using your foreign key to reference information from another table. So in our uh, section table right here, okay, we're not listing off every single field in the course table, are we? What are we doing instead? So the foreign key is going to allow us to get everything we need from the course. So we could do a simple join, and then we'd be able to get all that information without having it stored multiple times. Is that pretty handy? I think that's incredibly handy. Okay. So entity sets, that's going to be whenever you write out the entity name, you open up parentheses, you put all the different uh, attributes in it. Consider that. I would say don't bother, but, you know, consider it. Uh, and the main reason is, is that once you see it all sort of laid out to where you have, you know, all your different entities, so you have like entity one, attribute one, and so on. Okay, that's what an entity set is. Okay, so it may be easier to visually just glance and see which fields you're repeating. Okay, I'm not saying it will be. I'm saying it may be. Okay, do whatever works best for you. But pretty much anything you're ever going to do in here is going to be what type of diagram? It's going to be an entity relationship diagram, right? Okay, so specialization. All right, specialization is going to be where you start off with some generalized entity. I have person up here. Okay, so kind of running out of room here, aren't I? I don't think we need this anymore. So the idea here, we have a generalized, uh, that says person, okay? A generalized entity for person. And we got all the attributes for person, you know, name, whatever, okay? And then you're using attributes to classify them, okay? So let's say that person can be either a student, a faculty, or a staff member. So we just go ahead and plop in an attribute for like person status. All right, is everyone with me so far? And then that saves us from having multiple entities that are basically almost all the same except for a couple fields, right? Now, I got a downside up here, okay? What if a person is multiple things? So, for instance, how many of you work for IT? Okay. A couple. So you would be both a person, uh, not both, 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 you'd be both a student and a staff, right? Okay, so you can only have one value in this attribute, right? So how are you going to resolve it? Okay, so there's a couple different ways. Um, you know, certainly one approach would be to take the person entity and to just make three, in, uh, three other entities to represent all the possible classifications. The downside of that approach is now, let's say Ben works for IT. He's in here as a student, got all his information. We got it all again as a staff member. Okay? That's not going to be good, is it? What else could we do? Could we potentially make three different things? We could say student and leave that null if they're not a student. Could we do that? Probably not the best way either. Okay? So, you know, a better way than either of those two approaches is likely going to be using either inheritance or an associative entity. And in this context, an associative entity is not going to help us that much, is it? Okay? So we're going to use inheritance. Just like before, we're starting with a generalized person, only instead of using a specific attribute, we're going to have these sort of specialized lower level entities. Okay? So we're basically not creating an entire student entity. Okay, so if I were to create an entire student entity, it'd be a pretty big entity. It'd be a lot of different fields in it. We're leaving all the fields, or I should say, we're leaving all the attributes in the generalized entity. But we're just adding on the couple that relate to student. 
All right. So, I don't know, let's say student ID. Okay, and we have staff. All right, so let's say staff ID, I don't know. Okay, and then we have like a faculty. So each of these are inheriting everything from the person table. Does that make sense? Now, for that to work, what do we need to have as a foreign key inside of each of these? So exactly, we need to grab the primary key. That's going to allow us to inherit all of those. All right. So that's basically this in a nutshell. Okay. It's a little bit complicated to think about because, you know, what I was discussing earlier on this slide as a potential way around this was to get a student entity that has all the same fields from person plus the ones relevant to student, right? What I'm saying in inheritance is we're not doing that. We're having the person entity, and then we're just having anything specific to student and the student entity. And again, it's referenced with a foreign key. Foreign keys are a very important concept in relational database management. Okay? They solve a lot of problems, don't they? All right? So I'm not saying they're a silver bullet. Okay? But in databases, they're quite useful. Okay. So next, we have constraints on specialization. And mostly you're just going to be talking about the completeness constraint. Okay? And this is saying total specialization or partial specialization. And the difference is, is that if we have a person in total specialization, everyone in the person table must also be in at least one of these inherited tables. Does that make sense? So a person can't just be a person in total specialization. They have to be a student and or staff and or faculty. One of those three or more. All right, in partial specialization, this is going to be the default. Okay, And to be quite frank, this is what I'd recommend you use in most cases. Okay? So that's going to allow you to just have a person be a person. Okay? You guys familiar with leave Brittany alone? Okay? So Brittany doesn't have to be anything extra. She can just be Brittany. All right, that's partial specialization. Okay? And why do I say you should stick with that for most cases? Okay? The main reason is this. All right? Let's say that you're creating a person and you forget to assign them to a classification. Do you want that to just be okay for the time, or do you want to have to stop what you're doing and take care of it? So I think that it really depends on work environment and all that sort of stuff. I think that for my workflow, I'd rather just get an error message and deal with it later. Does that make sense? So partial specialization probably going to be a better fit for most things. All right, some common mistakes in ERDs, okay, using a many-to-many -many relationship. We talked about why that's a mistake. Uh, I don't think I need to repeat it. I'm happy to if I need to. But the idea is that with many-to-many, -many, we can't fit a foreign key on either side, meaning we can't uniquely identify each instance of the relationship, meaning that it's impossible to do any sort of join, query, anything like that, okay? No atomicity. I did finally figure out how to pronounce that word. Um, so that would be where we have fields that have multiple values in them. Okay, that's going to be a big problem. And when I say field, I mean attribute or uh, columns. Okay, Because, like I say, when you're trying to do a query, you don't want to have to use regular expression all the time. Regular expression eh, it can cause a lot of problems. Okay, So you certainly want to avoid anything like that. And then lastly, improper relationships. Okay? I'm not talking about that type of improper relationship. I'm talking about if we had one of these labeled wrong. Okay, so let's say we said that an order could have only one pizza order. That would be wrong, right? Because we know that an order can have multiple pizzas. All right, so we're not done yet. Uh, we're going to do an example together. But just kind of wrap things up. 
We talked about an overview of the general design process. Went into a lot more detail in the entity relationship model. Okay, we talked about complex attributes. Uh, we certainly talked about uh, different types of cardinalities. Got all them up here. Talked about why they're used and when they're used, that sort of thing. Talked about reducing redundancy. All right, that's a very important concept for databases. Not as important as foreign key, but pretty important nonetheless. Okay, and then lastly, we talked about entity relationship features. All right, so any questions so far? All right. So, let's do one together. Uh, you guys can use whatever software you want. Uh, I tried to use draw.io. I had a little bit of issues with it, so I'm going to use Visio. Okay, it's what I'm familiar with, but use whatever you're familiar with. So, let's just begin with a basic little entity. Okay? Everyone has a bank account, right? So you guys are familiar with the basic concepts of a bank, right? All right. Let's do an ERD for a bank. We'll start off with an entity. And what do you think we might should call this entity? What's the most important part of a bank? It's a people, right? So can I call this customer? Could I also call it person? What's the advantages and disadvantages to each? So both of those are right answers. Um, another right answer would be to call it person and then use uh, inherited entities. Okay. We'll stick to customer for now. Okay. But you all understand what I mean by that, right? Okay. So, for most of these, can we just assign an ID uh, column as we see fit? Yeah. So we can call this like cust ID, right? What do we need to know about our customers? Okay, think about Sarbanes Oxley. Obviously, we need to know name, date of birth, social security number, address. That's Sarbanes Oxley stuff, right? And again, I'm not asking if you're a fan of Sarbanes Oxley. Um, you know, I, I think you could certainly go either way on it. Um, I think that it's one of those things that has some advantages, some disadvantages. I'll leave it up to you for your opinion on that matter. But we just said we need to know first name, so I'm just going to call this F name. Okay, we need the MI, middle initial. And we need to copy this guy a couple times. All right, so we got the middle initial. We need L name, right? All right, date of birth. That's certainly an important field. Because let's face it, are there multiple Andrew Millers? Are there multiple Andrew S. Millers? Okay. Are there multiple Andrew S. Millers with my birthday? Maybe, but it's a lot less likely, right? All right, so we need SSN. We're a financial institution. We're required to have that. Um, let's see. We need add one, right, for address line one, address line two. What else do we need? That is exactly right. City, state, and zip. And someone jogged my memory. Why can I not just put address in a single attribute? Exactly. So it's it's not going to be an atomic single valued uh, field. Okay, and that makes it very difficult to search. Is that enough information for customer for now? All right. What else is important about a bank? Um, so, a loan is a type of what? That's an A. Account. Okay. And each account is going to have what to identify it? Account number. Could be account ID, but we'll go with account number. 
All right, and we know there are different types of accounts. Uh, I think Ron mentioned loans. So there's different types of loans. You know, we have mortgages, we have personal loans, we have car loans, you know. Uh, technically speaking, a credit card is a loan, technically. Uh, although it's probably not a good idea to treat it as such, but you know, not financial advice in here. I'm not trying to preach to you. So we're going to call this account type. And in this context, that's perfectly fine to do, right? We don't have to use uh, any sort of inheritance because we know that an account is only going to be one single type of account, and it will be an account as well, all right? We're not going to have an account that is not an account. That just doesn't make sense. Is everyone with me? What else do we need? Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. So one of the problems with doing that is there's a lot of joint accounts. Okay, so you got a husband and wife, they share an account. You got a co uh, company account, and there may be five or ten employees with access to it. Um, so we're not necessarily going to use um, that as a foreign key here. We could, but for the assumptions we're using, we're going to use something a little bit different. So we also want to know the starting balance, right? Why is that important? Well, it's how much we started with, and we'll calculate how much we had based on transactions, right? Now, for most accounts, there's going to be some sort of a max withdrawal, and that may be different by account type even. So we'll call this max withdrawal. Whoops, I said mass, not max. All right, and that's probably good for now. Now, right now, we don't have a way to tie customer to account. So what type of entity are we going to use here? So what type of entity are we going to use to tie customer to account and account to customer? Associative entity, that's exactly right. Okay, so we're going to call this cust account. And what are the primary keys going to be for it? Cust ID, and you said account number, right? And how'd you get those? Exactly right. Okay. I could not have said it better myself, in fact. Okay. So. We have our primary keys in customer account. What are we missing? What do we need to do here? So right click on them, set them as foreign keys. Or whatever you do in your software that you're using. Like I say, I don't really care what software you use. Okay. If you want to use draw.io, feel free. Uh, Visio, by the way, I think is installed on all the uh, computers in here. so. I find Visio a lot quicker and easier to work with. Um, I was talking with Paul. He said a lot of you preferred other stuff. So, you know, that's fine. Whatever. We don't really need anything else for customer account, do we? Because all we're doing is we're tying an account to one or more customers. All right. And then lastly, well, not necessarily lastly, we have account type. And that doesn't really reference anything right now. OK, so let's make that a foreign key, and let's make an account type table. So for the account type, we're going to have a very finite number of account types, right? Probably under, I don't know, 20, maybe? Because you got your basic checking account, you got your savings account. Big enough place, you probably have different classifications of checking and saving accounts, like. You got the one for the people with low balances, you got the one for the people with high balances, maybe one for in between. Does that make sense? So we're just going to call this account name. Okay. And you may choose to call it something different. Okay. It's important to note that the attribute that's a foreign key doesn't have to be called the same thing to reference something else, does it? Okay, we can use a different name. So I'm saying account type in the account entity, and account type entity, 
I'm actually calling it the account name. Okay, does that make sense? So we got the account name. Uh, we'd probably want to know a description. I think that makes sense. And what else do we need to know about the account type? So if we know the name, that's going to uniquely identify each of the account types. We're going to put the description in there. Can we think of anything else? And keep in mind, this has to be relevant to all different types of accounts. So checking, savings. Um, how about interest rate? Okay, we can put APY in here. Um, because pretty much any type of account is going to have that, right? So we'll put that in there. I think that's good enough for now. So, I'm going to use a good friend the relationship tool, just drag it on the screen. And we're going to connect these guys. All right, so customer to customer account. Now, we know that customer can have multiple accounts, right? Because, you know, most people in here probably have a checking account. They probably have a savings account, probably have a debit card account, okay? Debit card account's probably the same as a checking account, but, you know, you get the idea. You probably have multiple accounts. But in the customer account, we know it belongs to one and only one customer. How can we tell that? So customer ID is part of the four, uh, primary key, which means that it must be a single value and it must be present. It cannot be null. That's exactly right. Okay. So for the end symbol here, it's going to be, let's do the begin first. So it's going to be one and only one. But we know that a customer may have uh, one or more customer accounts with us, right? Because they may have more than one account. That's the whole point of doing this as an associative entity. Okay, otherwise, while the account may be held by multiple persons, if a customer only has one uh, account, we can just list the account number inside of the customer entity as a foreign key, right? But obviously we can't do that because customer may have multiple accounts. All right, throw on another relationship here. So we got a relationship going between customer account and account. So just kind of looking at this, if the whole thing will fit on the screen. There we go. Account has how many customer accounts associated with it max? Is there a max? So an account can belong to multiple customers. Therefore, we're not assuming there's a max, right? So that's going to be one to many. We can't really have an account that doesn't belong to anyone. Okay? That's what happens in that case. And you start getting the probate system, right? Okay. We don't want to deal with probate system. We're going to have it be one to many. Co account belongs to one to many customer account. Okay? Now, if you need to think about it, you can say account belongs to one to many customer. But really what we're doing is we're having a relationship between customer and customer account. Okay, customer account is going to belong to how many accounts? Okay, it's going to be one and only one account, right? How do we tell that? Account number right here is acting as a primary key. Which means that it's going to be there, it's not going to be null, and it's only going to have one value. Therefore, customer account to account is, in fact, a one and only one. So all we have to do is just change this other symbol here. To one or more. Or as I refer to it as, one to many. All right. So account and account type. Now this one should be pretty straightforward, right? Not doing a whole lot here. Okay, so we know right off the bat that account type 
may belong, I would say zero to many is perfectly fine there. Is it possible that a bank has an account type that's not used by anyone? Sure. All right, but an account is going to be a one and only one to account type. Like I say, it doesn't make any sense at all to have an account that has no account type. That does not make any sense. Okay? But we know that it must be present because we have account type as an attribute here. It's not going to be null. And we also know that it's going to have a max of one because it's acting as a single attribute there. Does that make sense? So you can have how many rows in one instance? One instance is one row, right? Okay, so one single cell here, using the term cell kind of loosely, it's only going to have one value in it, which implies that account to account type is in fact going to be one and only one. Any questions? What am I missing? Based on this information, can you tell me the balance of any account? Transaction, exactly. Okay, so without transaction, we don't have any idea. Okay, and as a bank to not have any idea about the account balance, I think that might be a little bit uh, a little bit crazy, right? Transaction. So let's keep it nice and simple and call it a trans ID. Okay, so for transaction ID. Okay, now, what do all transactions have? So transaction amount, we're going to call that trans AMT for transaction amount. What else do we need? So if we're using this as a calculated field for the balance, that's our ultimate goal, what two attributes are we going to need to have? So we'll get to those in a little bit, but for now, we're going to need to know the time and the day, right? Okay, and why do we need to know the time and the day? because we need to be able to sequence the transactions, right? If we don't know the time of the day, and I want to know what my balance was a month ago, how am I going to calculate that? I'm not. Okay? And by the way, these two fields would actually be automatically generated. Does everyone understand that? So basically, whenever the transaction is entered, you would have your um, database configured in a way to go ahead and automatically insert those two. Likely. Okay. And then we need to know the transaction from and transaction to. Okay. So, like uh, Ben was saying, we need to know if it's a debit or credit. All right. So, that's going to tell us. All right. And we just tie these into account. Now, technically speaking, um, we shouldn't really do it this way. Why not? What's the potential downside here? So the main downside of doing a single relationship like that is that technically speaking, this is going to be a many-to-many, -many, okay? Because technically speaking, transaction, there's both account from and account to, okay? Now we're going to be a little bit sneaky. Okay, we're going to call it one and only one but it's not actually technically one and only one. I think it's close enough to be able to get away with it, though, uh, because you're not going to see an issue where you can't identify an instance of the relationship. Does that make sense? Because we know that it's unique inside of here, and we also know it's unique inside of here. So I'm going to get away with it. So we're going to set the begin symbol here as one and only one, and the end symbol is going to be Zero or more. And like I say, if I wanted to really be a pain, I could split this into two tables. 
I think that gets needlessly complicated. And as is, this would work perfectly fine for anything in SQL, right? Okay, you're not going to face any issues where you can't uniquely identify an instance of the relationship. What I do need to do is make sure that I right-click these, set them as foreign keys. Any questions? All right, hope everyone paid attention. Next class, we're going to come in. I'm going to pass out a uh, sheet. We're going to work together to come up with an ERD. Then you're going to informally present it to the class, and we're going to critique it. Not in a mean way, of course, but just kind of give additional thoughts and ideas. So that's next class. Um, that's all I got for today. I will see you all tomorrow. I uh, hope you all have a good day. And like I say, come to class on Tuesday, ready to do some uh, some fun ERDs with each other. Okay, nothing like an exciting ERD. In fact, instead of calling it entity relationship diagram, I think it should be called exciting relationship diagram. But they didn't really ask my opinion.